My son-in-law, Brett, was raised in a small West Texas town, one of three sons, and they have so many funny stories. Stories about growing up in the small town in a small church. One of my favorite stories involves Brett's youngest brother, Reed. Reed was two years old, and on a Sunday morning, he really tested his dad's patience. Who knows what he did, but he was squirming and lively and was not, well, not responding to his dad's admonitions. And so midway through the service, Wes, the dad, decided he needed to take Reed out of the church service. So he stood up and started walking down the aisle, and Reed was just throwing a fit. Well, in every church assembly, there are these moments of silence, right? In between a prayer and a song. Not intended, but they just happen. Well, it was in just one such moment. Reed at the back of the auditorium, beginning to anticipate what was about to happen to his posterior, <laughs> let out a scream that fell right in one of those silent moments so everybody heard it, somebody save me! Well, he's, the last, uh, not f he's far from the last person to make that kind of request at a church. We all come looking for help and sometimes looking for salvation. And that's the right place to come because the church has, by God's plan, existed as that group, that society of people that are God's purveyors of help and hope. And as we look at all the promises that God made in Scripture, one promise in particular has to do with the church. Now, we're working our way through the Bible, looking at some promises. There's over 7,000 promises. No way we're going to look at them all. But maybe a sampling of them would encourage us to build our lives on these promises. One of these promises has to do with the church. Before we look at it, though, let's do what we do each week. We make a declaration. If you're new to Old Kills or new to watching online, we simply sit up straight. We put our shoulders back, and we fill our lungs with air and our hearts with hope, and we're careful to say it like we mean it, right? So let's give it a go. We are building our lives. Our, we do not... Thank you, Lord, for the promises that you give us. And today, Father, as we consider the promise of the church, we pray you would speak to each of our hearts. Forgive our speaker. His sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ, we pray. And all the church said, What is your favorite part of a wedding? I love weddings. I love the wedding cake. I love the wedding punch. I love the wedding celebration. I love the romance. Everybody, I think, loves a wedding. And most of us have a favorite moment. And my hunch is, for many people, the favorite moment of a wedding is when the bride appears at the top of the aisle. And we all stand up and we turn and we look. Oh my goodness, have you ever seen such beauty? dressed in that beautiful gown, hair made perfect, makeup just exactly right. It's got to be the best part of the wedding, except for this one. I have an idea. Now, just think about this with me. From my perspective as a minister, I've learned through the years that there's something else worthy of your attention. And that is not just the bride, but the expression on the groom's face when he sees the bride. Oh, she's beautiful. Yeah, I've never seen an ugly bride, ever. <laughs> I've seen a groom who could use some work, but I've never seen <laughs> an ugly bride. But from my perspective, looking at the bride, when everyone else is looking at her, I turn my attention over here and I catch a glimpse of the guy. Try that sometime. You will see what I've seen through the years. 
Sometimes their face is pasty white. <laughs> Sometimes they're breaking out in a sweat. And most of the time it's a slack jaw and cantaloupe wide eyes as they look into this beautiful bride. I once saw a rough and tough rodeo cowboy begin to weep. There's nothing like that moment when the groom sees the bride-to-be. And there's nothing like that moment when Jesus Christ sees his bride. Yes, he has one. The church. The reason that the church is often called the bride of Christ is because mainly the reference is made to the church as the bride of Christ by John, the apostle, in the book of Revelation. More than once, he refers to the bride, I'm not sorry, to the church as the bride of Christ. Here's two examples, one from Revelation chapter 19 and one from Revelation chapter 21. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So these visions invite us and excite us to think about the church as the bride of Christ, the object of his highest affection the one with whom he will spend the rest of eternity. We don't see the new Jerusalem as a city of stones and streets and gates, but the new Jerusalem as the residents of the city, the redeemed, the purchased, the inhabitants of the city. The bride of Christ is you. You. Christ has set his heart upon you. And the society upon whom he casts his highest affection right now is the church. He is preparing the church to be a part of his forever family. And for that reason, it makes sense for us to look at a promise that he makes regarding the church. So let's begin right there. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, here is the promise of the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now Jesus spoke these words in Caesarea Philippi. Any tour to Israel makes a stop in Caesarea Philippi, north of the Sea of Galilee. It's still there, the ruins, the, the image of an, uh, a big open cave that has come to be known as the gate of hell. It, it, it's, it's a phenomenal city that sat right on the border between ancient Israel and the Gentile world. It was a cosmopolitan city, a melting pot of a variety of cultures. People would come from as far south as Ethiopia and as far north as, as Ephesus, and the result was this maelstrom of religions, foods, smells, values, organizations. It was a little bit Las Vegas. It was a little bit Times Square. It was a little bit Vatican City. And it was in the middle of this maelstrom, this, this cross-cultural city, that Jesus asked two questions. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Now, by this time, the, the disciples had been following Christ for as much as two years, so Jesus knew they knew what other people were saying about him. But really what Jesus wanted to know was not so much what others were saying, but the second question. Then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Don't you think these words hung in the air like a just rung bell? Who do you say that I am? I may be wrong, maybe Peter gave an answer quickly, but I'm thinking there might have been a long pause. Maybe one disciple <clears throat> cleared his throat, maybe another kind of kicked the dirt with his sandal, maybe another looked away. They had been thinking about their answer, but no one had said it until now. And Peter, we know, can always be counted on to speak first. And so Peter said this. Here's what I think, he said. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Now every good Hebrew knew Christ was coming. Christ in the Hebrew mind meant the ultimate one, the very presence of God, not just the head of the class, but the only class, a class all by himself, not just the final word, but the only word that deserved to be spoken, the anointed one. Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter looked at Jesus and said, you are that person, you are the Christ. Well, Jesus was ecstatic. He said, you are blessed Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. When Jesus says upon this rock, he's not saying upon you, Peter, I will build my church. He's saying upon your profession, this confession of faith. I can build on that. This belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, serves as the foundation for this, the only eternal society in the history of the world, the church. Jesus says, I will build the church and the powers of hell will not prevail. Which leads us to this second point, and that is the permanence of the church. Some of you are familiar with the older translations that say the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In ancient cities, the gates of the city were the gathering place for the decision makers of the city. So to say the gates of a city or the gates of hell is to say the strategy session or the planning session or the decision making. Apparently, Satan has a gate, a place where his, he and his dominions gather and they, they, they make plans, they have strategies. And Jesus says that the strategies of hell to destroy the church will not succeed. He acknowledges that they will come. For that reason, the church is on occasion rocked back on her heels. But the church will prevail. The church will succeed. The devil will make his plans and launch his attacks. But the church will stand. Why? Not because the church is strong, not because the church is talented, but the church will prevail because her builder is faithful. Jesus made this promise, I will build my church. Jesus, the Nazarene carpenter, is still building. He's a builder. To build is to shape, to model, to create. Some years ago, we hired a rock mason to build an outdoor fireplace in a courtyard. What a builder he was. I stood in amazement at Jose, who showed up with a pickup truck full of stone and every tool needed and what was necessary to to cement the rocks together. Within an hour, he had unloaded everything in the courtyard and I stepped out to tell him what we wanted. He said, I can already see it. I've done this a thousand times. He was in his 60s. I'm confident that he had. Within a couple of hours, he had laid the foundation. By noon, he had stacked up the rocks. By the end of the day, he had already created the the, the essence of the fireplace. He came back the next day and put the finishing touches on. It was fascinating to watch him take a rock and chisel away the corners, to take another rock and split it in two, to take another rock and smooth it down, and then cement them together until it reflected the image that he had in his mind. Jesus is doing that right now. He is building the church, and we are the living stones of his church. How many of you have felt his chisel? How many of you have had a corner chipped away? How many of you have had a rough spot smoothed off? He has cemented us together by our common belief, our common love for him, our common belief in him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he has brought us together in the right place in the right time. I believe that you are sovereignly placed in this congregation if you're a part of this congregation. And I believe that he has positioned you to be a part of what he is creating. Maybe he's even got you nestled up next to somebody you don't like, but you don't get a choice. Because he is organizing his church. He is building his church. He said, I will build my church. Hmm. We're not church builders. 
we may facilitate, we may push a wheelbarrow, we may carry some rocks, but he is the builder. I will build my church, not I might build my church. I'm hoping to get around to building that church. If I can just get those people to cooperate, maybe I'll build. No, I will build my church church there it is for the first time in the bible the word that's so common to us appears in scripture ecclesia in greek it means to be called out i will build my called out those i have called out of society into this special relationship i will build them into a forever society And the powers of hell, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. Caesars will come and go. The temples of Caesarea Philippi will be turned into the ruin. But the church of Jesus Christ, built on the person of Christ, will prevail. Satan will try to defeat us. He may seem to succeed for a time. He'll sidetrack us for a generation or two. He'll lead us down the the dark alley of the dark ages. He will separate us from one another, but he will not prevail. He will not. If the last 2,000 years have taught us anything, they have taught us that what Jesus said in Caesarea Philippi is true. How many nations have come and gone in the last 2,000 years? How many societies have stood up only to fall down? How many systems have been created and disbanded, yet the church still remains? And Jesus invites us to be a part of it because he speaks not only of the promise of the church and the permanence of the church, he issues us to be a part of his passion for the church. He invites us to be active and engaged, to participate and to give our very best to the church. And can I just say thank you because so many of you do. So many of you do. There is simply no way I could adequately say thank you to each and every one of you for what you do to make this expression of Christ's church vibrant and alive and unified. Thank you. Thank you for every door you've opened, for every hand that you shook, every diaper that you've changed every child that you've hugged, every class that you've taught, every home Bible study that you've hosted, every person that you've counseled, every dull sermon that you've endured, every check that you've written, every season of patience that you've demonstrated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe that you know in your heart what this scripture affirms, and that is it's worth it. Amen? Amen. It's not easy. And that's because Satan has every desire to destroy and divide the church. That's why sometimes it's tough work, but it's worth it. So thank you. Others of you have mixed feelings toward the church. You're a fan of Christ, but you keep the church at arm's length. You appreciate what Christ did back then, but be a part of what he's doing today. The church, you have your reasons. There was that, I don't know, preacher in your childhood who went overboard, or that was that church that squabbled and split. There was that leadership that mismanaged the money or mismanaged scriptures, and you got a bad taste in your mouth and you became a member of this subculture in our society that has a bumper sticker that says, Jesus, yes, church, no thanks. You like Christ, but his church, not so much. If that attitude describes you, can I offer a gentle yet firm reminder. And that is the church, for all her foibles, is still the bride of Christ. And that bride is, at this moment, being prepared for the groom. And I'm not so sure the groom would think kindly of you thinking unkindly about his bride. 
He loves her. She could use some makeup for sure. And her wedding gown tends to get soiled and, and torn. And for one who's going to spend eternity with the Prince of Peace, she sure can be cranky at times. I get that. But still, Christ loves the church. He loves the bride. Can a person honestly say they love Christ and not love whom Christ loves? Besides, if you're in Christ, you're in the church. Uh, Yeah, that's right. If you are in Christ, you are in the church. When you said yes to Christ, you said yes to his forever family. Jesus did not add an invitation to his declaration, I will build the church, does anyone want to join? He didn't offer that. It's just part of the deal. It's part of the deal. I know. We have every imaginable hang-up and heartbreak and headache. We come from all tax brackets and latitudes and attitudes and tribes. We disagree on politics and presidents and even premillennialism. Yet for all that might separate us, there is only one thing that we need to unite us, and that is we say an amen to what Peter said. I believe that you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And that's all we need. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And upon that foundation, Jesus is building this forever family, this movement, this bride of Christ. And so can I urge you to renew your commitment to God's forever family? Can I urge you to pray for the church to use your unique strengths to encourage the church, to use your financial resources to support the church. And when you see that the church is in need, would you please step up and be a source of strength? If you happen to watch this week's video curriculum, you'll hear me tell a story about a sermon illustration that went awry some years back. I want to add an element to that story, but before I add the element, I have to retell it. It's a really funny story. I I had this idea some, I want to say 15, maybe 20 years ago, preaching on this topic, the bride of Christ, the church is the bride of Christ, that about this point in a sermon somewhat like this, we would have an honest-to-goodness bride walk down the aisle. The church did not know. It was a secret. But we had a volunteer dressed in a wedding gown with a veil over her face so that no human face would be seen. And at a certain point, I signaled to the band. They began the music. I signaled for the church to stand, and I pointed at the bride, and there she stood. Well, I don't know what I was thinking. But that veil, I mean, it really covered her face. And we had not, uh, we should have had a run-through, but we didn't. And so she could not see anything. And she realized when she took her first step, she didn't know where the aisle was. And she walked right into the back row. And she backed up a step or two and turned and walked right into another part of the back row. Finally, she got in the aisle and she started ping-ponging her way down the aisle. (laughs) What I didn't mention in the video, which is really an important part of the study, I mean of of the illustration though, is the way the church responded. People from all over the auditorium jumped to their feet. I mean, they were already at their feet. People at the auditorium began walking toward her to help her. Out of compassion. Probably a dozen folks helped the bride get down the row, the aisle. And that may be the best takeaway point of the illustration. And that is for sure, there will be times between now and the day Christ comes that the bride will get off track. The church will need a little help staying on target. But when we all realize we're all in this together, nobody can see everything, but those who can see do what they can to help those who cannot. Then we can celebrate that moment in which the bride of Christ will be presented to Christ. What a face we're going to see when we look into the face of the groom that day. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. The promise of Christ, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer. Amen. Let's all be standing now. Lord, as we stand in honor of you, we bless you and we praise you and we give you glory. We thank you and we stand because you and you alone are king and you and you alone deserve to be worshiped. Please renew our commitment to your church. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.